Welcome to the InfoMullet YouTube channel. If you enjoy this content, please like or share. And if you'd like to support the InfoMullet by becoming a mulleteer, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Hi, this is Timothy Clancy, and today I'd like to talk about uh, an analysis technique I use called fractal segmentation. And I'm going to be doing this in the context of studying violence, but I think this method of analysis can be used in studying all sorts of complex problems. I'm going to go through how you might use it in other problems. Uh, for background purposes, I'm a PhD candidate at Worcester Polytech Institute, uh, studying reduction of violence and instability using system dynamics. So uh, this method, actually, I first ran into um, working in Afghanistan, counter roadside bombs, a specific method of fractal segmentation. But what I'm gonna walk through today is, is kind of explore the method using violence in America, specifically homicides, but not limited to homicides. And this phrase, the coastline of violence, it comes from, in mathematics, there's this problem called the coastline of Britain problem. And the question, it's a, it's a thought experiment, but the question is, let's say you have to locate lighthouses on the coast of Britain. You, you've got to figure out through analysis where to put lighthouses, how many lighthouses you need. And it's a really interesting thought experiment um, as it gets into this question of fractals. So let's start looking at how this problem was addressed mathematically and and what that means for studying other complex systems so the first thing that you find out is that and this is very counterintuitive but the shape of the coastline of britain actually changes depending on what you use to measure it this may seem completely counterintuitive but i can show it with a few simple visuals so Let's say you start out measuring the coastline of Britain using a 200 kilometer ruler. So you have a ruler, it's 200 kilometers, it doesn't bend, and you simply you know, lay it end to end around the coastline, you would get a shape much like this. It doesn't look much like Britain at all. Um, but let's say if you took that uh, same concept of having a ruler, but you simply reduced the, the measurement in half, you would improve, this is called improving the fidelity. So rather than a measure that the fidelity was 200 kilometer rules, now it's a 100 kilometer ruler. So you see that the rulers are actually much smaller, and when you lay them end to end, you begin to get a little bit of the curvature of the coastline. Um, you're, it still doesn't look like Britain, but it's actually looking a little bit more realistic. And again, you can decrease uh, the measurement again by half to 50 kilometers. And now you begin to see a, a much more rich shape. You're getting a lot more detailed of the ins and outs of the coastline. And, and you've gained that increase in by, by increasing the fidelity of your measure. You went from a 200 kilometer ruler to a 50 kilometer ruler. Well, what does it mean then, our problem of how many lighthouses do we need? So when you actually calculate this, you find that the length of the coastline of Britain, the smaller the measurement gets, the larger the coastline you measure and therefore the more lighthouses you need. So at a 200 kilometer measure, the lowest fidelity in this example, you need 23 lighthouses, it's 2300 kilometer coastline. As the fidelity doubles, right, it gets twice as good, you're a 100 kilometer ruler, you're, you're, um, you're actually at 2800 kilometer coastline and you need 28 lighthouses. And then as you get half again and your ruler is 50 kilometers, well, now your coastline's 3,500 kilometers long and there's 35 lighthouses. And this is what's called the paradox, right? It's only one coastline. There's only one Britain, but yet you measured it with three different types of rulers and got three different measurements. And that relates to your problem of three different numbers of lighthouses. So there's a few lessons that, that's taken from this mathematical paradox that we apply to when we're doing analysis. And the first is, as you change the fidelity of your measure, your problem space is gonna change and your solution space is gonna change. By what I mean is that first image of Britain was a very different image than the one with the higher fidelity measure. And the solution, the number of lighthouses went from 23 to 35. So change, simply getting a better measurement tool can literally change the problem space and what a solution means within that problem space. Uh, fractal patterns, um, the, second, the second lesson is that fractal patterns repeat at each scale. And what that means is no matter how you increase the fidelity of that measure, so we went from 200 to 100 to 50, you could go to 10 kilometer rulers or five kilometer rules or one kilometer rules. This pattern of increasing coastline 
and needing more lighthouses, it continues at each scale of the fidelity. It, it's kind of a continuous pattern. And a lot of times when we think of fractals, we think about geometric patterns that replicate either perfectly or close to perfect at each level as you zoom in on them. You know, you kind of see this uh, repeating snowflake pattern, the visual element of fractals. But fractals aren't always visual. It's, no, it, it's this concept of a pattern that repeats at scale. And uh, as we notice, <laughs> the fidelity increases, your length of coastline increases. And that creates a limits problem. Uh, so the limits problem is, uh, in theory, when you, when you extend this out, you actually get a coastline of Britain that is infinite long. If you, you think about it as, as I reduce the, the, the scale of my ruler at each iteration, the coastline got longer and longer. Well, in theory, an infinitely small measurement would result in an infinitely large coastline. And that's a little conceptual. It's, it's theoretical. There's obviously a, a fixed limit to actual size. We could get down to Planck scale and measure that way. But it is an interesting concept that you can get, you could theoretically have a length of the coastline of Britain that is 10,000 or 50,000 kilometers long, depending on how small your measurement is. And that's called the limits problem. So now that was the original paradox. And it used only one dimension, which was geography and the, the ruler approach. What happens though, if you extend the paradox by adding a new dimension? So the dimension here is median income. Let's say for some reason with lighthouses, we wanna know not only the coastline length, but the average median income of Britain and use that to determine our lighthouse problem, right? Well, we could use the fidelity of a country level measure and we could say that the average income in Britain, the median income is 26,000 pounds, right? That's, that's one fidelity. But just like the, the, the ge geographic measure and distance, in this dimension of median income, we can increase the fidelity and say, all right, we're gonna get regions. And now you begin to see a lot of variation pop up. You see incomes as high as 44,000 pounds and as low as 35,000. You know, you get a range of variation. And you can even keep doing this to get down to, you know, the parliament constituents. These are very small segments in Britain. And you can begin to see all these variations of median income. So again, the same concept applies. As we increased our fidelity of measure in the dimension of median income, the detail we got uh, and the, the level of clarity we got changed in front of our eyes. The shape of the problem literally changed in front of our eyes. And uh, we could add two more dimensions. Uh, maybe instead of median income by geography, we wanna look at median income by career. And the fidelity here is by occupation. This is simply averages of uh, wages by career. It doesn't say whether you've been in the career a long time or a little time. It's a low fidelity measure, but you can really see these differences now, we've gone from a median of 26K uh, thousand pounds to some of these are as low as six and seven and $11,000 uh, pounds. Um, you could also do it by gender, right? You could, you could have a fidelity that says, and this fidelity here is just a simple men and women, the gender can get more complex, but a very simple gen, uh, fidelity is men and women. And you can look at median income along that scale. Uh, so what are the lessons we take from extending the paradox? Well, the first is that as you, just as you add dimensions, or when you added fidelity, it changed your problem space. By adding dimensions, different things you're measuring, you also change the problem space. Our problem was one thing when we were just looking at the coastline, but when we started looking at median income, it became a, a, a completely different problem. Uh, also, the solution space continues to change with your problem space. So these two things are linked. As you add dimensions and increase fidelity, you're not only changing the problem space you're dealing with, you're also going to change your solution space within which you form policies to so, sort of help solve these issues. And, and why is this called fractal segmentation? Well, remember what a fractal is, right? It's a, a repeating pattern at scale. And the pattern that repeats here is of an inequality distribution that, that appears at each new dimension and replicates at each increase of fidelity. So as you add dimensions of different things we're measuring, again, you get this, 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 uh, dynamic of your problem space and solution space changing. And then within each dimension, as you increase the fidelity of the measure, you also get this sort of fractal scaling where now your problem space and solution space are changing uh, with each improvement of fidelity.
So how does this all relate to the coastline of violence in the United States? This is what, a, you know, kind of the purpose of this video. That was all background. Now let's apply this concept of fractal segmentation to violence in the U.S. So when we normally talk about violence, uh, it's like the homicide rate, we're usually talking in one dimension at very low fidelity. And you'll see something like this, right? This is all these, the, the next few series of charts all come from uh, 2017's FBI's the, uh, Unified Criminal Report data. But we'll often talk about the homicide rate in the US is 5.3, that's 5.3 murders per 100,000. And it's one single unit of geography at the level of a country. But maybe we go to the state level. This is a concept of improving the fidelity of our measures by getting to a state level measure as opposed to a country. Well, what does it look like? What does homicide look like when we begin to segment by state? Well, as you can see, you have ranges now. What was 5.3 across the nation now goes from lows of 1.3 in North Dakota to as high as 12.4 in Louisiana. And you have all these variations between. You can see in the upper right here on the scale, um, you know, you're talking about a range of variation from the, the ones, and it's usually high ones as, as a fraction, up to the teens. And this is just adding one fidelity of state. It's not even really good fidelity. We could talk about metropolitan statistical areas, which are called MSAs. These are large metropolitan areas that have a downtown plus the surrounding suburbs. Uh, they're used in census statistical. We track crime by this. So we could now look at, and again, these, these numbers here are for the MSAs in that state. So you can see that Louisiana, where it was 12.6 for the state, is now 13.7 for the MSAs within that state. And you have a low up here in, in, uh, you know, in the northeast here of the 0.8 and things like that. You get very wide variation. This, we, again, we're, we've, we're now at the second level of fidelity. Uh, we could also do cities not in MSA. So cities sometimes don't have suburbs, they're isolated. We could look at that and see, okay, here's a much lower average homicide rate. We could uh, look at non-metro counties, rural areas that have no cities within them. And again, you get very low rates of homicide here on average. Uh, although some areas, you know, you got 9.4 in um, South Carolina there. So what we found is that Already, we see the same effect in violence as we did in the coastline. Every uh, change of fidelity of our measure changed our problem space. Here's the three examples side by side. This is a state level view, a city, or excuse me, an MSA view, a cities outside the MSA view, and a non-metro counties view. Uh, three views, and you can pause and look at the numbers, and they, they change based on what you're looking at. But this is all second-level fidelity. This is still pretty pretty crude fidelity. Let's, let's see how far we can go on the fidelity of um, measuring violence, how accurate we can make our measurements. Um, let's first go from state to counties, right? So I'm going to pick a, a state here, uh, Illinois, because there's a, a lot of data on this, on this, this uh, location and geography for Chicago and things like that. So I'm using it because there's lots of data. But the, the state level is 7.8 homicide rate, which is, again, the national average is 5.6. When we segment the state, Illinois is 7.8. But when you break it into counties, you begin to see that this, again, this inequality distribution. Uh, and the, the guide here is that the, um, the red counties have a rate of 8.4 murders per 100,000 or higher. The yellow counties are about three murders per 100,000. And the green counties are about 1.8. So when we say fractal segmentation, here's another fractal. As soon as you took the state and broke it into county, you had another inequality distribution where a few counties were creating a large amount of the murder rate. And you can go from counties to cities, right? So here's Cook County was a, a red. And obviously if you translate that to Chicago, you now have a murder rate in the city of Chicago of 24.1 murders per 100,000. So we're at the fourth level of fidelity, which is a city. We've gone from nation to state, to county, to city, and already our number has changed from 5.6 murders per 100,000 to 24.1. And this is starting to get pretty good fidelity. I mean, city's not bad, but we can go further. So maybe we go from cities to city sections. You start dividing Chicago into different large areas of the city. And uh, we started with 24.1 as the city view, but when we break it up, and I apologize for my graphics here, but I tried to shade some broad areas based off the data I had, um, you can see that this 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 homicide rate really varies widely. There's most of the city is at 
murders per 100,000. But there's two areas um, that I've, I've marked there in the darker blue where the murder rate is 62.7 in these areas. So now let's, let's focus in on those areas. Can we get even more detailed? Well, yeah, we can go from city sections to community areas. So now I'm going to focus in and break out those two sections that were, were high uh, violence rates. And this is what it started at. And we break it out into actual uh, community areas or neighborhoods. And you can see here the violence rate in some places becomes extremely high. We're talking neighborhoods that have over 100 murders per 100,000 per year. The highest one is 203. And this is now a level five fidelity. This is a very high level of fidelity, which means that we've gotten into the ability to really get um, down to the details of the data sets. And we've seen that that, that the murder rate is vastly different, even within the city of Chicago and even within the high violence cities. Well, because this is Chicago and there's been so much research, you can actually even get further than neighborhoods, further than level five. You can actually get to, um, well, first of all, let's look at that same representative of community area using slightly older data. I found this research online. I had pulled from 2017 uh, FBI. These are pulling actually from 2001, 2008, and 2014, and you see the reference there below. But this shows by the, the color coding that same concept of um, level five fidelity of community errors and the rates of violence, and you can see the distribution is varied there. Uh, but let's go to level six. A level six view is a community area to neighborhood clusters. Now you're starting to see an even smaller fidelity an even tighter measurement. And again, you're seeing a lot of white space peer up that hadn't been there before. And that's a low murder rate, whereas the concentration of violence is in even smaller areas. So now we're talking about um, not necessarily blocks, but small neighborhoods. And we can even go a step further and get to street segments, right? So now we're at a, a level of fidelity where you're literally measuring what streets do murders occur on. And this is what it looks like uh, in Chicago for those three time periods. Those small, small dots that are darker color are where the murders are concentrated. So you can even see the neighborhoods which in which which sort of all one color of high murder rate. When you get to the street level, they dissolve into a few streets of high violence and um, lots of streets with much lower violence in those neighborhoods. So what does this all mean? Let's take a step back, right? What are we seeing from this information? Well, it tells us that the violence across the dimension of geography, right? We're still in one dimension. We're only in our first dimension, is a highly differentiated system. Well, what do we mean by that? So brief foray into math. Um, there's this concept called the Lorenz curve, and it measures differentiation or inequality in a system. If you've heard anything or read anything about wealth inequality, income inequality, the Lorenz curve is a measure of how you can um, evaluate the inequality in a system for something like income or wealth. And what it looks like is uh, this graphs those, those, that street level view. And if you look here in the vertical axis, this is the cumulative percent of all violent crime. And this is the, uh, on the horizontal is the cumulative percent of units measured. So if you see these three lines, you have it measured by street segment, neighborhood cluster and community area. And what that means is, so the, dot, the dotted line shows the Lorenz curve for street level violence. And that means that um, at 25% at of the units of streets measured, if you go up to here, you find that it's about 75, 80% of all violence occurs on just 25% of the streets. And you can see here that by the time you get to the far right, 100% of all violence occurs on 100% of the streets. So the, the area under the curve in Lorenz is, is, talks about the level of differentiation. And this is a visual way of depicting that inequality. This is a very unequal system. Now you can take the Lorenz curve and translate it into a number, which is often easier to work with than, than plotting curves. And this one may sound familiar to people who study uh, wealth or income inequality, and it's called the Gini coefficient. This Gini coefficient is a is a sort of an index of inequality pulled from the Lorenz curve, but presented as a single number to give you an understanding of um, how unequal a system is. So again, this is that same data from the uh, papers, and what they're doing is they're plotting a Gini coefficient. Now, the Gini coefficient 
is just a number that goes from zero to one. And zero means a system is perfectly equal. Every unit you measure has an equal representation of whatever it is you're measuring. A uh, Gini of one is a completely unequal system, which means one unit of all the units you measure accounts for 100% of whatever you're measuring. And what that means in this case is these are tracked for, for homicides that occurred in these units of street, neighborhood, or community. So you see here that the neighborhood cluster, uh, this lowest dash line here is at about 0.45 Gini. What that means is that, um, you know, it's, it's it, it, the, the, the point on the Lorenz curve that it equated to meant that it didn't take a lot of the segments of neighborhood clusters to account for a large amount of the crime. Uh, and you can see here that at the street level, as we improved our fidelity, the street level became far more unequal. And a 0.75 Gini is extremely unequal. It means that the vast majority of crime occurs on a very few streets. Uh, and this is, again, you're, you're starting to see, if you're thinking about this, you're probably already getting ahead. If I'm a cop or police officer or community activist, and I'm trying to reduce crime in Chicago, what this tells me is there's only a few streets that matter in my city as opposed to uh, trying to solve it across the entire city. Uh, but, but hold that thought because there's some, I don't want people to go too far down that road. We're, we'll get into broken windows later. I want to pause here, but just point out that you're already starting to see how one dimension, only one dimension at really good fidelity starts to change the nature of your problem. But uh, let's take a step back. The fractal segmentation, right? It's a method of analyzing highly differentiated systems through many dimensional measurements, right? So we've done one dimension. This is where I wanted people to pause. The use of fractal segmentation is not to take one dimension to high fidelity, it's to take 18 to 23 different dimensions and get them all to a very high level of fidelity on each dimension, as precise as you can go with the available data. So this entire up to this point has been one dimension geography up to level seven fidelity, and you could see how the problem changed. So what are some other dimensions of violence we can measure in Chicago? Again, because Chicago is well studied, we have this data available. Well, we already did geography, that was level seven. Well, we can look at gender or sex. And again, level one, low fidelity measurement, male, female, and not known. Uh, and you can see here that the murders in a year, and this comes from um, Chicago Tribune, their, their data analysis, you can see that overwhelmingly the sex of the victims is uh, male. So that's now a second dimension. We've had geography, we can add sex, we can add race, ethnicity, and you can see here the distribution between black, not Hispanic is very high, not known is very high, white, not Hispanic is, it gets much lower. And again, these inequality patterns are, are repeating. It is not an equal distribution of violence across all the segments of this dimension. It's clustered in a specific segment. Age, this is, uh, and I don't know why it, it drops down beneath zero there. That's a Chicago Tribune, bad, bad, bad data graphing. But you can see as the age, there's a certain range here between um, early teens or mid teens and probably late thirties for which the overwhelming amount of homicides are clustered. So again, age, another dimension, right? And again, the fidelity here isn't super high. It's by years, but it's, it's something. Um, maybe we look at the dimension of time. And we look at the fidelity of months in a year. Where do the murders occur in months in a year? Well, you can see the clustering that occurs is in the summer months, right? It begins here in March, June, July, August, September, October, and then it really drops off November, December, January, February, uh, March, April. You can see it starts in May, actually. So you just taking the segmentation on the dimension of time at months shows you that the whole year isn't the problem. It's certain months. Well. What about days of the week as time? Again, you can see this inequality appear that uh, they're Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, maybe a little bit into Monday because it's, early, as we'll see in the later slides, early Monday morning. There are certain days where most homicides occur. It's not in the middle of the week. It's not Tuesday and Wednesday. It's generally in the weekend and early morning hours of Monday after the weekend. Well, let's, let's check then. Let's check hours of the day. You, you, you we're now at a level of fidelity where we're literally saying, what hour of the day do these murders occur? And again, you see this clustering now is begins in the evening hours, really around seven or eight is where it begins, becomes highest and increases uh, and stays very high through 
probably about 4 a.m. And this is why I think Monday was included because it's including, it's the 4 a.m. of the day following Sunday. So you actually see now that, you know, in Chicago at least, the, uh, on these specific areas, right, the, the murders are not occurring equally throughout the day. They're very specific times. Well, what about some dimension like temperature, right? Let's, let's, let's get away from the obvious criminal demographics of place and things. Let's talk about temperature, though. And this becomes very interesting. So this fidelity is a study that looks at 10 degree increments of weather in Chicago and how much um, violence occurs during that. So what we've got here on the left is the daily max temperature in, in Fahrenheit. And we have the firearm injuries and the gun crime. And these are sort of mathematical indices. So one is actually the um, baseline of normal, which is why I, I sort of bolded that out. And above one means higher than average. And what you can see here, what I've circled in red, is that it's very clear that the hotter it gets over 70 degrees, right? 70 degrees is a clear threshold breakpoint here. For every 10 degrees it gets hotter over 70, the more violence you have in firearm injuries and gun crime. So now we've taken a dimension like temperature and use that to understand perhaps why those months of the year have a higher concentration because the temperature is higher. Let's really get crazy though. Let's talk about social network. This is a dimension as well. So this dimension of um, is, is talking about the connections between people and the circumstances they're in. And the fidelity level I'm gonna show you right now is just individuals, right? So the picture you're about to see has a bunch of nodes depicted and each node is one individual and there's 138,000 in this diagram. Now the red nodes were killed or wounded and that's about 10,000. And the blue nodes are not killed or wounded. Now they're going to be located in this picture based off proximity to one another, which means the closer the dots are, the more likely they are to have social connections. So let's take a look at this. If you notice, this isn't a picture of random blue and red nodes scattered. There are clusters of um, red nodes that sort of group together and that, that visual tells us that these folks share social network commonalities. That's not just, even within the, the everything we've already talked about, all the dimensions uh, of, of geography and time and weather and streets and all that, even then, if we break it down by social networks, it's not equally distributed. It's still concentrated in a very specific way. And we say, okay, how do we do explain that further? We add another dimension, which is we add time to social networks. Right now we're combining two dimensions into one to something I call circumstance. And it's actually a, a level five fidelity measurement that's about a cascade effect within what are called co-offending networks. And this is a little tricky, so we'll walk it through it. But what a co-offending network looks like is you start with one person who gets shot, and that's that, that dot at the upper, upper part, and that results in the network of two additional shootings that are an outgrowth of the first shooting. So these people share a social network, they share a connection, and it may not be uh, a, a, a pre-designed intentional connection. If, if, if someone who's a member of the gang um, is trying to retaliate for a previous shooting and they shoot the wrong person, that can create a connection that then ripples through that social network. But you can see here that this one shooting um, resulted in 12 people in a cascade of co-offending networks being shot. Now, these aren't all deaths. These are just shootings, but it demonstrates the cascade effect of this social network over time. These people have connections, which are because of that first act of violence. Well, here's one of 34 people shot, and this is, notice the time. This is over a four-year period, so it's not like this is happening every weekend, but a lot of these are happening in very short periods of time. There'll be a burst of violence and retaliation, often with criminal gangs, and these cascade networks can get quite large. This is one where there were 64 people shot from one initial shooting. The Cascade Co-Offending Network went on for six years and resulted in 64 people getting shot. So this dimension now is giving us a ton of useful information and saying, hey, wait a minute. Shootings aren't just random distributions of time or place or temperature or um, age or, or, or circumstance, they are very specifically clustered around all these dimensions and they come together to create these cascading networks. And I wanted to share this quote from the paper where I got this research and it says, we detected 4,100 separate cascades 
ranging in size from cascades with a single subject to a cascade involving 469 subjects. These cascades visually reinforce how gunshot violence spreads through a co-offending network, connecting individuals who initially may have had no connections to one another. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, let's take a pause. I want to stop right now and be very clear to say the violence in these neighborhoods isn't because they are black neighborhoods. That is a very common misconception that unfortunately it seems like conservatives like to perpetuate and liberals like to avoid. That the fact that Chicago, that the violence is occurring in these neighborhoods, is are, these are black neighborhoods and that, well, that's just because they're black. No. The violence is because of policies we pursued in the 20th century to punish blacks leads to violence, right? The policies we put in place, the racist policies, and there's some listed here, redlining, yellow lining, the war on drugs, restrictive HOA covenants, highways just demolishing through neighborhoods. Those conditions that we use to sort of oppress and systemically repress black communities are enabling conditions for violence. That's why Chicago is violent, not because it happens to have a black population. And this again can be shown through this kind of analysis. And so I wanted to take a pause here to show how these policies in the 20th century created the conditions which lead to the violence we're seeing today. So this is a red line map, and this is um, a map that was used to determine loans for houses. And so the Federal Housing Authority would grade by color, and you can see on the left here the key. Green is best or highest rated area for issuing loans. Uh, um, the blue is still desirable, Yellow is definitely declining and red is hazardous. So the concept of yellow lining and red lining comes from these maps. And you can see Chicago, they've actually marked red a whole lot of the areas and say, don't make loans here. Well, uh, or, and yellow is kind of, you're at risk here. These decisions, which are often very racistly influenced at the time they were made, have extreme consequences in how those neighborhoods and communities can gain access to investment funds, whether it's buying a house with a loan or remodeling an area or developing a business property, it all depends on the ability to gain loans. And at some point, if there's a map saying, don't loan to anyone in here, or you're not going to be guaranteed by the government, you're going to dry up the financial capability to invest in those communities, and they're going to decline over time. Now, add to that uh, highway developments. When the highways get built in the, you know, the latter part of the 20th century, they tended to be built right through the neighborhoods that had the least representation and sort of that tended to be more susceptible or vulnerable to political influence. So you can see here these red lines or the additions of the major national freeways. Well, when you overline the freeway map with the, uh, the red line map or the red yellow lining map, you see that there's a, it, it goes right through the areas that had been previously designated as declining. And I apologize for my animation. I'm not working for Disney here, but bear with me on the animation. So now you have an overlay of the freeway demolishment on top of the redlining loan maps. And then let's take our map of violence clusters and move that map on top of it. Ta-da! The areas of highest violence tend to be on those areas that were systemically affected by these policies in the 20th century. This shows very clearly that it's not just a, a black population thing. It's literally a, a reaction or consequence of policies put in place uh, that creates these conditions. So again, taking that step back now, why is American violence like the coastline of Britain problem? Well, if you notice, as we added dimensions and improved the fidelity, we changed our problem space. We went from trying to solve violence at the level of the nation at 5.4 to looking down to individual community areas, neighborhoods, even streets at different times and circumstances, the temperature, all of this data changed the problem space. And as we change the problem space, the solution space continues to change with it. So as we get more information and more of these dimensions, I only went through about 10 dimensions. So there's a lot more. If we were doing this formally, there'd still probably be twice as many more dimensions to track and get to high level fidelity to craft a policy for reducing violence. And at each edition of that dimension, you saw that inequality distribution pattern crop up again. That's the fractal pattern. And I'm, I, you know, I could show it with sort of graphs and charts, but think about it at each time, at every addition of dimension and increase of fidelity, you improve the understanding of the problem and found that it was unequally distributed. So homicides, 
turns out have quasi-fractal properties. They continue to increase in rate as the fidelity increases. If you notice, we started with 5.4 murders per 100,000 in the U.S. And we had some states where it was one and some that states were as high as 13. But when we started going into neighborhoods, we found neighborhoods that had a homicide rate of over 200 per 100,000. So as you improve the fidelity of the measure, just like Britain got a longer coastline every time we, we got a sharper fidelity of measure, the homicide rate continues to increase. And let's be realistic here. In the coastline of Britain, it's a hypothetical that you would get an infinitely long coastline. But I don't think that would happen with violence because there's a physical practical limitation of that the violences themselves are not infinite. It's a, it's a finite number that you can only distribute no matter how what dimension you look at fidelity. So that limits problem is much more of a theoretical problem and not as much as a practical problem. And that's important because a lot of people look at fractal segmentation. They see that limits problem and go, well, if we just study violence enough, we'll have an infinite violence in one square inch of property and that won't be useful. No. These are very practically applied because there are limits the, 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 that get activated far before you get to infinity. So how do you craft policies with fractal segmentation in mind? How do you go about reducing violence if you recognize this coastline of violence problem? How does that change our thinking about how to reduce violence based off this kind of analysis? Well, we know that as dimensions and fidelity increase, problem space changes. So what problems are you trying to solve? Does it exist where you are trying to solve it? This is a really key question. People are often trying to solve a problem where it doesn't exist. Violence does not equally distribute across the country like a fabric. It exists in very concentrated local areas with very specific circumstances and conditions around it, which we can determine by analysis. But we shouldn't try and solve violence where it doesn't exist because that's going to be a waste of time. And we're missing the opportunity to solve violence where it does exist because we're focused on the wrong area. So select a policy that fits the problem. And as dimensions and fidelity changes uh, or scales change, does your solution become invalid? If you had a solution for solving violence at the national level, would that really be effective when we're now at the street level in Chicago? Would it be effective over in Wyoming or North Dakota had a very low homicide rate? You've got to get very specific with your policy tailored to the circumstances you are trying to fix. And then evaluate the trade-off between intended and unintended consequences, right? Another benefit of this is if you segment sufficiently, a lot of times the solution becomes self-apparent. What I mean by that is as you get to 18 to 25 dimensions and you're doing very high fidelity mapping, you have so isolated the nature of the problem that in some ways it actually becomes the solution is kind of self-apparent, self-evident, self what you need to do to solve this problem. But you don't get there unless you've done the, the hard work ahead of time to do the fractal segmentation. But so what are the consequences of the wrong approach? Well, if you solve a differentiated problem with an undifferentiated solution, right, that results in a waste of scarce resources, right? You spread your, you're, you're trying to solve this coastline of violence by just treating it as a national problem. Well, you're going to spend a lot of scarce resources in places that don't have violence, and you're not going to have enough resources in the places that are violent. You also risk type one errors. These are false positives. You're, you're, you end up, um, if, let's say you're doing a criminal justice solution to violence. You're going to end up with more people in prison not for actually being violent, but because your solution was too broad and too undifferentiated, even though your problem was differentiated. And that's going to result to broad pushback on over-policing. I think a large um, uh, amount of the concern with over-policing these days is because we used really badly constructed policies in an attempt to reduce violence, and that resulted in a lot of false positive mass incarcerations that now is getting legitimately pushback. Like, what's going on? Why are we doing this? This clearly isn't working. But the same is true in reverse. If you try and solve an undifferentiated problem with a differentiated solution, that also has a consequence. So, um, you know, we've been talking about homicides here and showing that it's very highly differentiated, but let's say we just assumed every problem was like that and tried to get a really custom tailored uh, circumstance specific policy in place for something that didn't have that kind of variation. Well, you're still going to waste scarce resources. You're going to narrowly focus this, them in on a small segment of the area when you actually have a large problem. And you're going to have type two errors. These are false negatives. This means you're going to miss Instead of the false positive is you arrest someone who didn't do the crime or wasn't guilty of what you were trying to do in the criminal justice sense. 
A type two area is you let the wrong people go or you don't punish them. They go away and they can offend and commit offenses because you're missing them because you're too narrowly focused on what is in effect a broad problem. And this creates a pushback of under-policing. And the area, I don't have research on this, but I'm, I'm suspecting that when you talk about sexual harassment and uh, assault and things like that, you're talking about a less differentiated problem where we are using highly differentiated solutions and it's not working. So the pushback you see on the frustration of how you know, rapes and sexual assaults and things like that are prosecuted is because we're under-policing it. We're, not, we're, we're trying to be too specific for what might be a very broad problem. So there's a risk on either side. And, and, and here's a case study. So I, I asked people to pause when they got to broken windows, because if you're at all familiar with broken windows, when I was getting through that geography, you might have been saying, you know, the dimension of geography you might have been saying, ha, this is broken windows. Broken windows is an example of what not to do. So it was, a, what is broken windows? For those who don't know, it was a policing method from the 1990s. Uh, and it was pioneered in Los Angeles, New York City, where the primary as this was deployed. The theory is, is that ki crime concentrates geographically and a indicator of crime is, is lesser crime leads to greater crime. And so if you have an area where there's a lot of broken windows, hence the name, right, or graffiti or loitering or other petty crimes, that will be an area that results in major crime. And so the application of that theory is that you go and you over-police those areas where there's a lot of petty crime. The problem with this is that they only took a single dimension of measurement at high fidelity. They really had good data on that geographic clustering, but that's only one of the 18 to 25 dimensions we worked with. They never went to those other dimensions. The, flawed, the premise was flawed too. It presumed that crime was somehow an escalation path from you throw a rock in a window and next thing you know, you're murdering someone. Well, that's pretty much bogus. People, people, we, we talk about random violence. Very little violence is actually random. There are causes and reasons why violence is committed. And that gets into that cascading network and those social networks that I showed of that. There's very often very specific circumstances that, that precede violence and have nothing to do with whether a window is broken or there's spray paint or something like that. Uh, and and this, was, this becomes evidence. If you take the solution of broken windows and say, well, let's just police based off geography, it doesn't scale as the dimensions and fidelity were increased. Remember, every time we increase the dimension and fidelity, our problem space has changed. So broken windows policing is year round. It doesn't take effect. It doesn't take account of time differences that we saw different months, different days. It doesn't take account of temperatures. It certainly doesn't take account of circumstance of the actual co nature of the co-offending network. So the one solution proposed was just the easiest one at the lower dimension. It didn't account for anything else as a scale. It also ignored the unintended consequences that if you throw a bunch of police into a narrowly confined area whose job it is to go around and, and, and stop everyone, you're going to end up with a lot of type one errors. And this is, you know, stop and frisk is an excellent example of this problem in New York City. They looked at the geography, they saw where there was the most violence, and they just sent in police in waves to stop everyone and see if they had firearms on them. Well, as a result, about 800,000 people went to jail who probably didn't need to, and it's really debatable what the effect of that was. Um, the historical judgment on broken windows is not kind. So we have the data now. So it was very popular in the 90s and continued in New York in one form or another through the first part of the uh, 21st century. But we now have the data to know that this was a really, really bad policy. Uh, we found when we compared, so there was a general reduction in crime across the world and certainly within the United States over the same period of time that broken window. So what happened is they, they implemented this in Los Angeles and New York, right when that crime wave was reducing in the late 90s. And they took credit that it was this policy causing the reduction. But there were pol there was reductions in crimes in all sorts of other cities that weren't putting this in place. And now with a historical perspective, we can see that broken windows, not only uh, broken wonders, sorry for the typo there, it's broken windows, but maybe broken wonders is a correct uh, slip there. Um, it actually fared worse than doing nothing at all. You would have reduced crime to a greater extent in New York and Los Angeles had you not implemented broken windows at all. That's how bad a policy was. It actually made, even though crime still reduced, it, it didn't reduce as much as it would have had you done nothing. So again, it's really important in these things to falsify your premise when talking about these analytical tools and, and clearly understand this isn't a hammer for all nails, right? You can't use this just willy-nilly on all problems. So how do you know when not to apply fractal segmentation?
Well, you go back to that Gini coefficient, which is the measurement of inequality in system. It's a simple number. It goes from zero to one. So you have a nice crisp number that you can use to make a decision of do you fractally segment? And one is a completely unequal system and zero is a completely equal system. So uh, ask yourself, what is the Gini coefficient of your problem? I, I know people think of this as wealth or income. It, that's just how it's commonly used. The Gini coefficient can be used to measure inequality in virtually any system. It is not limited only to those. So if you have a complex problem you're solving and you don't know what the Gini coefficient of your problem is, you should go find out because you really need to understand what level of uh, how the inequality distribution works. Is your system differentiated or undifferentiated? And if you do know, well, okay, if your Gini is low, right, it's like, a, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, your problem is undifferentiated and your solution should be broad, right? It's a pretty easy guideline. A low Gini means goes for broad solutions. And by broad solutions, I mean encompassing wide populations. Where your Gini is high, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, your problem is differentiated and you need to segment along fractals to identify those differentiated solutions. So we saw in Chicago with the, the street level view, the, the Gini level was 0.75. That tells us we have a highly differentiated system and we need to go to the effort of fractal segmentation, adding those dimensions, adding that increased fidelity. It, the problem told us how we should go about evaluating it. But if you don't know to listen to what the problem is saying, you're gonna blow right past the step and just pick the wrong one. So a question I get asked a lot, oh, this is all really good, this is theoretical, it's academic, blah, blah, blah. Is anyone actually doing this? Well, yes. If you've at all followed me on Facebook or any of my comments, you know I've been pushing a particular form of violence reduction for many years now because it uses fractal segmentation. Um, it's called pulling lovers, or sometimes is known as focused deterrence. Uh, and that's the, the common names that you may run into it by. Um, it is a very focused approach to reducing violence. It, it, it focuses specifically on two types of violence, criminal gang violence and domestic violence or intimate partner violence. These two types of violence actually account for the majority of all violence, right? These circumstances, and, and I, whether we're talking um, individual acts of violence or even things like mass shooting. I've shared the analysis before that showed something like 70% of mass shootings result from criminal gang violence or domestic uh, or an outgrowth of domestic violence, right? That, that holds true for individual homicides as well. A large percentage of overall homicide violence occurs from these two circumstances. So folk polling lovers looked at these two and they did a fractal segmentation on each one. They didn't do it combined. They did 18 to 25 dimensions at high fidelity each on criminal gang violence and domestic violence. They were different dimensions. They did a lot of research. They got to very high fidelity in the data and they found that really refined problem space. And it was different problem spaces for domestic violence from criminal gang violence. They didn't end up at the same answer and that's because they used these segmentations. Um, and they identified how those highly differentiated systems worked. Uh, they found that a very small number of high risk cases produced the majority of violence. So, um, you know, it, one example is Los Angeles where this was had a pilot done. You're talking a city of multiple million of people. When I say small number of high risk cases, the pulling levers approach in Los Angeles was able to identify, I think, 300 people out of a city of millions that were at the highest risk of being a victim of criminal gang violence or an offender in a criminally uh, gang violent act. So all of a sudden you talk about, you've gone from a city of millions down to a population of few hundred. It's, it's a much different problem you're trying to solve with that level of detail and data. And how does pulling levers work? Well, it, it proactively identifies these focused risk areas. So I gave the example of Los Angeles and gangs. In domestic violence, for example, in Massachusetts, it identified something like 5% of everyone who had uh, came on their radar for potentially being a risk of domestic violence caused like 80% of the violence. So they were very focused on not just anyone who had a divorce or anyone who had a restraining order. They had 18 to 25 dimensions and they got a very focused group that constituted the high risk area. And then once, and, and again, for criminal gang violence, they really had it narrowed down. Once you have that kind of focus on a high risk area, you can overwhelm them with services. And I mean, you know, you're talking about support finding a job, maybe there's medical assistance or mental health assistance. There's all manner of services, community services that can be used to 
um, get ahead of this problem. You're talking about before the crime is committed. This is a bit like precognition, but it's not, you know, just guessing the future. It's saying these are potentially high risk of committing a crime or being evicted. So they overwhelm them with services and the police are used as a deterrent but not as incarceration. So the term focused deterrence means while you're providing all these services, um, the, you, 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 the, the cops are there and say, hey, we know Mr. Domestic Violence Partner Risk Person, you just had a restraining order, you just tried to buy a firearm, you've had a tumultuous divorce, and yes, you're getting a lot of services, but we are watching you. So if anything happens to your partner, we're on top of you. And the same thing with criminal gangs violence. The police would be upfront to let them know, all right, we understand the circumstance. There was a shooting last night. A member of your gang was killed. You're going to want to go out and get retaliation. You're going to want to go out and um, get some payback. But know that we're watching you, and we're very focused on you. So if this person, you know, if something happens, we know who we're going to go to. And this is key because it's using the police in this limited deterrence fashion that isn't about incarceration. Incarceration is the last resort of these types of efforts. They're much more focused on the services delivery. And what that means is you aren't putting people in prison in case you did have a type one error. I mean, this isn't perfect. You may get the wrong person, but you don't wanna just go out and grab them off the street and throw them in jail because then you're gonna perpetuate a problem of mass incarceration. So these pulling levers and focused deterrence systems are very much about finding that small group and intervening with services to be positive, uh, create a positive shift in direction while using the police as a deterrent, not as a, uh, a, a, an offensive actor that's going to go out and arrest them, but as a deterrent to keep them from doing the action. And this all helps break the feedback cycle. And people misunderstand how this feedback cycle works, especially in criminal gang violence. So what I want to do is show you an example of how this works in practice. And, and, and we're going to take one of those cascading networks from Chicago, criminal gang violence, 64 people are shot. And it all starts from this first shooting. This entire network hub of branching um, cascades, some of which peter out and don't result in more violence, others which create their own cycles and their own branches of, of, of retaliatory violence. This is how, why pulling levers is so effective. So this is what actually happened. This is historical. What pulling levers would do is, let's say it identifies at this point in the violence cycle that this is at risk. So this is where pulling levers intervenes and says, okay, we realize this, this dot in the circle, this shooting just happened, but now we're intervening in that focused risk group with, you know, very high overwhelming services. We're going to provide all the services you need. We're going to intervene with all the services and by the police are watching. So if anything happens, you know, you're going to jail instantly. It's not going to be a long period of time before you get caught. And so this intervention happens at this. And what they can do is if they can stop that next shooting from occurring by intervening here, this is what it looks like. Right, so now we've gone from 64 people shot to eight people shot. And that's the power of this method of reducing violence is it gets ahead of this feedback effect before it proliferates and, and creates vicious cycles. And that's why it's extremely effective at reducing violence even though no one was incarcerated. See, here's the thing. If you only had the eight shootings and you were able to stop it, you don't have to go out and arrest all the other um, 50, 50 whatever people that might have been involved as victims or perpetrators, it frees up resources, it keeps people out of jail, it lets the police get more proactive than reactive, and it creates a very virtuous outcome where it's deployed. Now, pulling levers is unfortunately only being piloted in a dozen or so, two dozen cities, which is why I'm frequently promoting it. Um, but it should be expanded and, and researched and further tested, but it's a very promising use of this kind of fractal segmentation because it understands that the circumstance of criminal gang violence isn't just random, it's very specific across those 18 to 25 dimensions. So the conclusion, right? The coastline of Britain had certain properties to it, these fractal properties that as you increase the dimension and you added fidelity, it changed the nature, the shape of the coastline of Britain changed in front of you. Well, American violence is the same thing. It is in effect its own coastline. As you improve the fidelity of your measures and you add dimensions, the shape of American violence changes. And it's a highly differentiated system. So that means that you can't make one size fits all policy and expect to deploy it nationwide or even statewide or countywide. You've got to get very specific to each city, neighborhood and get in there and do the work to find a solution that's going to work for that area. 
And it, it, the benefit of fractal segmentation and the requirements of it is you've got to look at 18 to 25 dimensions at high fidelity. You can't just look at one or two or three. You've got to do the work to dig in and get a bunch. But as you do that, it's going to change the problem space in front of your eyes, just like we saw the coastline of Britain change, or we saw the nature of violence in Chicago begin changing as we added dimensions, the problem you're looking at is going to change right in front of you. And that's going to change the solution. And the solution space, as it changes, it's going to become, uh, uh, as you get better, that solution space is going to identify solutions to you that no one may have thought of before, right? It, it, they, the result, when you do fractal segmentation, you often get very unorthodox innovative but powerfully effective solutions because you've narrowed down all that extra noise that you don't need to be paying to attention to to focus on the actual problem and again thank you for your time today uh, i appreciate it if for those who watch the entire video if you have any questions comments uh, leave a note below on the video or email me at this address um, hit me up on facebook i'll be happy to answer uh, I'm going to post this. Hopefully people got something out of this and let me know if you'd like more content like this. Uh, thanks a lot and have a good day. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to follow the InfoMullet, visit us on Facebook or Twitter. And if you'd like notifications when we post new video content, click on the red subscribe button below the video. If you've ever wanted to become a mulleteer and support the InfoMullet, visit us on Patreon. We appreciate the support.